cancer. Few words in the English language prompt such dread and fear in us. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you aboard the Bible bus for another great adventure in God's Word. Today, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, has a very personal message for us as we turn to 2 Kings 20 and hear about the life-threatening illness that plagues Hezekiah. Dr. McGee also talks about the day when he received a cancer diagnosis. Now, we got just a few minutes before we begin our study, so while you get comfortable in your seat, I want to share a few emails from our World Prayer Team members. First, we hear from Catherine in Pineville, Louisiana. As I pray each day, I get my world map out to see exactly where the country is. It helps me focus on God's Word reaching out to them, as it does to me, and changes how I think and act. It is a special privilege to continue to study the Bible with Dr. McGee. Thank you for your faithfulness to make sure these studies are on the airwaves around the world. I have contributed a little money for gas in the tank of the Bible bus each month. Blessings to each of you as you continue the vision of reaching the whole world with the whole Word of God. Well, it's great to hear from you, Catherine. Thanks for partnering in prayer and support with the World Prayer Team and then with the whole ministry as we work together to take God's whole word to the whole world. And here's an email. This one's from Patricia. I've been riding on the Bible bus for six months. I enjoy the view and fellowship that God's word provides. My eyes have been opened, yet sometimes the world still pulls me off course. I thank God that he has seen me wandering and put me back on the right path through this program. Many are being fed and led through this wonderful ministry. I have been saved for many years, but was not reading enough and therefore not understanding the Bible. Dr. McGee was gifted by God to tell his story to his children that they may be drawn closer to him. I praise the Lord for this ministry. And then she goes on to pray for us. I thank and praise you, Lord Jesus, for taking my sins and washing me clean again and your Holy Spirit for shining your light in the dark places of my mind and showing me the truth. I pray for all my brothers and sisters to keep listening to Through the Bible and that our prayers for all to receive His saving grace are answered soon. Thank you so much for that encouraging prayer, Patricia, and it's a joy to have you aboard the Bible bus with us. Why don't you join me, Catherine, Patricia, and thousands of other Through the Bible listeners as we travel the world on our knees with the World Prayer Team. It's an honor and a privilege to watch God answer our prayers as He works around the world. You can sign up today at ttb.org forward slash pray. Let's do that now. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that reveals your nature and your character, your plans and your purposes. Would you open our eyes so that we can see and understand your great personalized love and care for each one of us? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come back to this man, Hezekiah. He is a king that's outstanding. The fact of the matter is, he's labeled here as a king that there was none like him after David. And there's none that came after him that could compare to him at all. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. That's the testimony that's given to him. There's no king after him that was like him. And among the kings of Judah, not any that were before him, none to compare to Hezekiah. But now this man takes sick. And we read, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Now this is recorded three times in the scriptures, recorded here in 2 Kings 20, and you'll find it in 2 Chronicles 32, and you'll find it in the 38th chapter of Isaiah. And each one adds a little something that the other does not add. I intend to deal with it more thoroughly when we get to Isaiah, but there are certain things here that I'd like to call attention to. This was, I think, a very difficult task that Isaiah had of delivering a death sentence to Hezekiah the king. And very candidly, though, it doesn't make any difference who you are today. This sentence of death rests upon each one of us, although we do not know the day nor hour. It's appointed unto man once to die, 
Now, this is a divine day. If each one of us knew the exact time, would it actually not change our way of living? That is something that a great many, even Christians, say, well, that's something that's way off down yonder in the future. We won't worry about it. Well, we may not worry about it, but we at least ought to live knowing that that is and will be the ultimate goal. Some time ago here in Southern California, before I had cancer, a very fine young minister, he was told by his doctor that cancer had recurred and that his days were limited. And he sent out a letter to some of his friends, and I was privileged to be included in that list. Very frankly, I was shaken when I read it. And I'd like to give you a quotation from his letter. He says, one thing I have discovered in the last few days, when a Christian is suddenly confronted with a sentence of death, he surely begins to give a proper evaluation of material things. My fishing gear and books and orchard are not nearly so valuable as they were a week ago. Now, with that in mind, let's look at this, and then I want to give a personal testimony today. Will you notice? In verse 2, he says, Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept so. I think I understand his position, and I think probably you would understand if, suppose that you were told that you had cancer, and you didn't know what the outcome would be, and the doctor didn't know. I very frankly felt all my life and my ministry when I'd go to see people with cancer, I could understand how they could have cancer, but I never could understand that I would ever have it. And it rocked me when the doctor told me that I had cancer. I couldn't believe it. Then when I had to believe it and was not given any assurance at all because it didn't know and I have none today, I just know I have it. <laughs> May I say to you, it gives you a different sense of values. Life is a little different. A great many people have wondered about my conduct in certain areas. Why did I resign? pastor of a church when I'm still active. Well, those things are not nearly as important today. I have no ambition in a ministry. God gave me the privilege of being pastor of a church probably during its heyday and of having in my time the largest midweek service that has probably been in this day and generation. I consider that a privilege. And I have no ambition. I want now to live in such a way that I'm going to please the Lord. And you know something? It's caused me to change in many different ways. Someone said to me the other day, said, you're trying to kill yourself in carrying on this radio and holding conferences. You know, I'm afraid I'm going to displease him. I turned my face to the wall. when I was taken to the hospital and didn't know what the outcome would be. I said to the nurse, I couldn't get in bed. I was so weak. And not physically weak. I was frightened, friends. I'm a coward. And so she said, are you sick? I said, no, I'm scared to death. She's a Christian nurse. She actually smiled at that. And I said, let me alone here for a little while. She said, we want to get you ready for the operation. I turned my face to the wall, and I cried out to God. I told him I didn't want to die. And I didn't want to die, friends. Miss Stewart, who was the editor of the Amplified Bible, she's since gone to be with the Lord. She and I carried on quite a bit of correspondence over the years, almost a running battle because I questioned her on some of her translations, and very candidly, she changed several that I called attention to, and so she and I had quite a bit going. And she wrote me while others, and I announced it on radio and asked everybody to pray because I believe in faith healing. I don't believe in faith healers. I do believe that we ought to take these things to God in prayer. And I ask people to pray. And she wrote me, she says, I'm not going to pray that you get well because I know you're ready to go and be with the Lord. So I'm just praying that he'll take you. Well, I got an answer back to her in a hurry. I said, now look here. 
I said, you let the Lord handle this. Don't you try to tell him how I feel. I don't want to die. I want to live. I want to live as long as I can. And therefore, I've been afraid since then not to do as much as I can because at that time, when I turned my face to the wall, I promised him. I said, Lord, if you'll raise me up, I'll teach your word everywhere I can go. And that's what I've been trying to do. I don't want to let him down because I don't want him to say, well, look here, preacher. I'll have to call you home because you're not doing what you said you do. And that's the reason I'm going to keep it up, friends. May I say to you, you have a different outlook on life when you're in a position like this. And it's wonderful, though. Somebody says, well, it's wonderful to see you trust the Lord. I said, I'd like to know what else I could do. I'm in the place where actually the doctor says he can't help me. And he very frankly says what's happened so far. I'm not healed, but he very frankly is a wonderful Christian. He said, God did this for you. And you know something? I wanted to know why he sent me the bill if God did it, because God's never sent me a bill on this at all. It's wonderful, friends, to be in a position, very frankly, where you do have to trust the Lord. I have no other alternative. Where in the world am I going to go? I'm trusting the Lord. And when I say that, I'm not being pious. It is forced on me. Now, let me move on here, because this is a tremendous section. He says, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I've walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart. Well, I couldn't say that. And I've done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. He called attention to his good works, and he had them, by the way. I didn't call attention to any. I just put myself on the grace of the Lord that's in Christ Jesus. Now it came to pass, before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, tell Hezekiah the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I've heard thy prayer. I've seen thy tears. And believe me, he could have seen plenty of mine. I'll be honest with you, this is a time, friends, to weep at a time like that. Behold, I'll heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I'll add unto thy days fifteen years, and I'll deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, this is quite wonderful, isn't it? The Lord told him, I'll heal you, and I'm going to extend your life 15 years. Now, I've been told nothing like that, and I don't think today that the Lord does that sort of thing. Now, there are several people, including my wife, that has great faith that the Lord will permit me to finish this five-year program. I don't know. I don't have that faith. I just go on day by day, and every time I think of it, I ask him to let me do it. I want to finish the five-year program. I have great sympathy for Hezekiah here. This chapter means a great deal to me. I hope it'll mean a great deal to many of you out there listening in today. Now he says, and I'll add to thy days 15 years. Now, this is amazing. And Isaiah said, verse 7, Take a lump of figs, and they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Now, God used natural means to raise him up, but God used also supernatural means. Now, I think this is wonderful. Now, that's exactly what James meant. When James said that you are to anoint him with oil and then call for the elders to pray for the man when he's sick, what he's saying is this. There are two ways that a person could be anointed with oil. One would be ceremonial. The other would be medicinal. Now, a great many people seem to have missed it, but in James, it's medicinal, not ceremonial. Actually, what God is saying through James, and James is very practical, he says, call the doctor, but be sure and call for the elders, the church, to pray for him. And the prayer will raise him up. And so in this case here, they put figs on here. I think he had that which we would call cancer today. It's called a boil here, but I think it would compare to that. And so God says, I'm going to give you 15 years, but you better put the figs on there. And this idea today that you're not to go to a doctor, I went to what I believe is the best cancer doctor in Southern California. Many people have turned to him because of the case that I've had. 
But I also say that the Lord did it. He says the Lord did it, but he did send the bill, by the way. So, friends, my recommendation is to anyone, let's not be fanatical, let's be sensible. You got cancer? <laughs> then face up to it. And that's another wonderful thing my doctor said. He said, I'm not going to deceive you. I'm going to tell you exactly what's wrong with you. Because he says, if I didn't tell you the truth, you'd not have confidence in me. And that's true. I want to know it, what the facts are. And this man here wanted to know. And believe me, God laid it out before him. God's going to spare him and enable him to live. And this is something, though, that's quite interesting. Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, what shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? Now, may I say that here again, that's the reason I do not know what the future is. God has given me no sign whatsoever. I want to finish the five-year program. You see, when this happened, I was in the two-and-a-half-year program, and I asked the Lord to let me finish the two-and-a-half-year program. When we got to the end of that, I started the five-year program and asked him to let me finish that. And I have a friend, he says, I know you. If the Lord lets you finish the five-year program, you'll start a 10-year program and ask him to get you through that. Well, I said, that's an idea. May I say to you, I think we have a right to go to him. He's my heavenly father, you know, and I want him to lead me down here as long as he possibly can. Somebody says, we're praying that the Lord will take you. I say, you keep your nose out of this this is between me and the Lord, and you let him handle it. Don't you tell him how to handle it. I want him to let me live, and I think that would be the case of others. But suppose he doesn't. Well, may I say to you, you just have to accept it, don't you? It's not always his will. And I notice in the early church, James was made a martyr. And then what happened to Peter? Peter's delivered from prison. I don't know why one was delivered and the other became a martyr. But all of that's in the providence of God, and it's his will that we're after. And my point is, oh, God, bend me and reconcile me to your will, whatever it is. But I'm going to let him know what I'm thinking about it, and I want him to know what my will is in it. And I don't agree with anybody that tells I'm praying the Lord will take you. You let the Lord handle that, by the way. I've never prayed that prayer for anyone except those who've asked me. I used to go to see a dear lady, and finally she got in such pain, and she knew she wouldn't get well. She said to me, she says, Dr. McGee, don't pray now for me to get well. Just pray the Lord will take me. And that's what the Lord did, by the way. But I would not do it unless the party wanted me to. Now, we are told here, God gave him a sign. And Isaiah said, verse 9, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken, Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? And Hezekiah answered, it's a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. They would let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. And he gave that as a sign to this man Hezekiah. Now Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord. And he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. Now may I say that I'm going to have to make a statement and this is the thing that blanches my soul. This is something that makes me think twice. Do you notice what happened here? Verse 12, At that time, Baradoc, Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah. For he'd heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Lovely gesture, sent him a get well card. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them, showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices, the precious ointment, all the house of his armor, all that was found in his treasures. There was nothing in his house and in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. He did a foolish thing. He let the king of Babylon know the treasure that Solomon had gathered and that the wealth of the world was there. In fact, that cave in Kentucky where we keep the gold, it didn't have near the gold that Solomon had, and he had it stashed away. And it wasn't generally known where it was. But Hezekiah wanted to be big-hearted. These men had brought a good well card from the king of Babylon, so he does this thing. Verse 14, Then came Isaiah the prophet 
unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? From whence came they unto thee? Hezekiah said, Why, they come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. I gave them the tour. I rolled out the red carpet for them. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that's in thine house, that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, shall be carried unto Babylon. Nothing shall be left, said the Lord. You see, those ambassadors, they made an inventory, and they took it back to Babylon, and it was stashed away there for the proper time when they needed gold, when they wanted to get the treasures. Here was the place to come. And he says this, And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. This is the thing that's going to happen to your offspring. You're going to have an offspring now that's be a disgrace to you. Good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. And he said, Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? I don't like Hezekiah's statement here. What he's saying is, well, it's going to happen. It's getting bad outside, but it won't happen in my day. And as I look about us today, I think some of us older folk, we're going to make it through all right. What about your children? What about your grandchildren today? Now it says the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might, and how he made a pool and the conduit brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? We'll see that later, by the way. Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, friends, let me say this, that this man, and this is an awful thing for me to say now, you know he should have died when the time came for him to die? Somebody said, you don't mean that. I certainly do mean that for the very simple reason that there are three things that took place after God extended his life. One of them he showed the king of Babylon after he was recovered, and he should never have done that. And he begat a son by the name of Manasseh, as we've seen here. And I want to tell you that he's the most wicked king of any of them. In fact, there are none like him at all. And then the third thing that he did, and this is something that is very tragic, he reveals an arrogance and almost an impudence, by the way. You find here that he not only permitted the ambassadors from Babylon to see his treasures, he not only fathered Manasseh, the worst king of all, but his heart was filled with pride, and it's hard to understand how this could happen to this man. Over in Second Chronicles, the 32nd chapter, verse 25, it says, But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. You see, it might have been better if he died at God's appointed time. And that's the reason that this poor preacher today, I tell you, I want to be very careful because I want the Lord to spare me because of the fact I'll do a little good, not because of anything within me, but just because of the fact that I don't want to disgrace him from now on in, since he's been so good to spare me even this long. My friend, this is a wonderful chapter. We have a wonderful heavenly father. He is sick. <laughs> oh, don't run to a man or a woman today. Oh, how deceitful that is. Go to your heavenly father. And by the way, He's the great physician. Turn it over to the expert, specials. He'll handle your case. May God richly bless you, my beloved. You know, Dr. McGee did just that. He turned his case over to the expert, the great physician, and he was healed of his cancer. He finished the five-year program and went on to serve the Lord for more than 15 years until God took him home old and full of days, as it was said of Job. His cancer never returned, for which he gave the glory to God. And remember, this was back in the 1970s when cancer treatment was very different than it is today. In times of illness, grief, or sorrow, we need the Lord's comfort. And if that's where you are, 
or maybe someone you love is today, we offer several digital booklet downloads by Dr. McGee that we think can help. Just visit the resources section of our website at ttb.org or to get in touch by phone, call 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll see you here next time as we continue this great adventure through the Bible. Jesus came home, home to him I home. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.